Ebo at uh, Rice University. And this one we offer to all of you in log as the last page of that log, log 54, to perhaps make for yourselves. But we also use it here as an image uh, of the framework for thinking about co-authorship today. Today we have gathered, prompted by the publication of log 54 that Anne Louis and I co-edited this year to discuss some ways that we might think or rethink authorship in architecture and recast it perhaps different from, perhaps as different forms of co-authorship in an effort to nudge us all uh, in practice, in academia, in the discipline towards a more generous and less egotistical conception of architectural production. Now, conversation uh, will be the mode by which we co-author this event, uh, but it is both a political choice and in a way the key topic of today's conversation. Um, we're, so we're really excited to be able to gather four of our local contributors to the journal here with us tonight. Sorry, getting used to the mic distance. Um, each of their contributions approaches the question of co-authorship uh, in a really different way, as you'll see in their presentations here tonight. Um, but for us, also importantly, between all four of them, there are some shared questions about co-authorship, about temporality, and about translation, and we'll revisit these shared uh, ideas uh, in the conversation after their short presentations. Um, so starting here, uh, Lisa Haver-Thompson is a historian interested in questions that lie at the intersections between law and architecture. Um, Timothy Hyde is a historian of architecture at MIT and the author most recently of Ugliness and Judgment on Architecture in the Public Eye. J. Yolande Daniels is an associate professor of architecture at MIT here. Her work bridges between operative constructions and critiques of form and between the practice Studio Sumo, which she co-founded with Sunil Bald in 1995, and independent research. Um, she's also a member of Black the Black Reconstruction Collective, and in Log 54, uh, we had the honor to speak with Yolande and Amanda Williams, uh, uh, speaking on behalf of BRC. Christina Pereño uh, is an architect and educator uh, here also at MIT, uh, where her research, Trans Tectonics, explores cultural and environmental implications of expanded temporal sensibilities in architectural and material practice, um, which we'll also hear about a little bit more through her contribution. Now, if and when you read this issue of Log, which we also hope to inspire you today to do, you will note that we were interested in assembling some alternative conceptions of agency that we notice around us everywhere, agency in architecture specifically, without draining those uh, alternative forms of their power to shift the tone and the disposition of the field of architectural production, which we thought might require something that Lauren Berlin describes as learning to walk in the wet sand of the questions that shift on the occasion of an impact by the other. In the project, we invoke a we, a non-universalizing, hopeful we that carefully holds differences together as we trek through the wet sand of co-authorship together. In this, we were helped by many co-authors, Ursula Le Guin, one of them, whose carrier bag theory of fiction we relied on, suggests that hero stories to which we believe standard ideas about authorship in architecture belong are powerful, that everyone and everything becomes part of hero stories. And this is her. Before you know it, the men and women in the wild oath patch and their kids and the skills of makers and the thoughts of the thoughtful and the songs of the singers are all part of it, have all been pressed into service in the tale of the hero. But it is not their story, it's his. Now, in order to write different stories, life stories instead of hero stories, Le Guin maintained her own carrier bag full of wimps and klutzes and tiny grains of things smaller than mustard seed and intricately woven nets and mouse's skull full of beginnings without ends and far more tricks than conflicts. She had many more, more things in that bag, of course. With her book, as you can see uh, here, but also through other forms of intellectual kinship, Donna Harway also joined uh, with her various creatures and kin from early on, following them in our carrier bag, for a carrier bag theory of co-authorship, we included some of the key frameworks that regulate authorship, but also 
passionate construction, silicone sealant and critters who want to traverse it, webbed connections, unfinished objects, both as objects and as agents, rules and regulations, hopes for organizing a disciplinary commons, contestations of regulations, useless products, traces and scars of violent histories, new ways of valuing work, anonymous signatures, developers, financial interests, political allegiances, solidarity, both willed and non-consensual, metaphors and technologies that enable communication. Now, you might be guessing that this kind of radical inclusion also means that our hopeful we, which now also includes all of you, consensually or not, does not just carry the bag, we has to be included in it, for it also designates all the bag's contents, as well as all the frictions, tact, and tenderness that enable exchanges of transformative co-authoring. So in order to take a closer look at this wet sand of co-authorship, which changes uh, even through our engagement with it, one way began with the observation that co-authorship registers most clearly against the backdrop of structures that attempt to contain it. So three key structures that have tended, that we observe have tended to maintain the boundaries of architectural authorship, and we'll encounter these uh, in our conversation today in different manifestations. They are first, the disciplinary and cultural narratives of authorship, those hero stories that Le Guin described in so many different guises. Second, the legal codification of authorship of ideas, uh, of, uh, of ideas and copyright laws, governing and also reinforcing the idea that the way authorship and ownership are deeply tied. And lastly, the professional codification of responsibilities and liabilities from contract documents to the structure of offices and collaborations. These structures are all intertwined and mutually reinforcing, and we flag them with the goal of orienting ourselves in the opposite direction towards and around co-authorship. Now, you might be seeing things accumulate in our carrier bag here as we go. That's the part of our gimmick for the, for the slideshow. Uh, and the last image that popped up is from Alberti. And some of you have, might have heard or been taught one of architecture's origin stories involving a Renaissance treatise that offered an early formulation of architectural authorship. Around 1450, Alberti, who at the time had no documented architectural experience, expertise, offered a detailed procedural imagining of the design and building processes. It was by all accounts a deeply strange, problematic, and impracticable proposal in its time. Yet it has been routinely naturalized as the radical beginning of the discipline of architecture, or as the origin, original division of labor, including the emergence of forms of exactitude and immutability of architectural ideas. Now there have been many, many interpretations of this origin story, but we were interested uh, in what the Renaissance historian Marvin Trachtenberg had to say about the way in which Alberti and some of his contemporary humanists embraced the emergent merchant time. He proposed that while merchants and bankers, quote, transformed temporal into monetary value, the humanists interpreted the value of limited human time in exquisitely personal existential terms of individual literary study, achievement, and fame in a powerful discursive current that vied with early capitalism in dynamic energy. And so Alberti's architect, author, transformed the previous meaning of octor as founder builder into the originator, validator, adjudicator of the entire form and meaning of the work. Large swaths of contemporary architectural production continue to uphold forms of authorship that are contained in that early definition. Misdefinition, as you might have gathered from what I said. But to understand authorship critically, we must look beyond statements that authors make about themselves, argued art historian Molly Nesbitt. For her, the legal definition of authorship became a reliable standard of measurement for understanding it as a framework of possibilities at any given time. To many histories of copyright law, or the many histories of copyright law begin with book publishing and book printing, and thus with the financial interests of publishers, seller, booksellers, as well as authors. And in many ways, despite some transformations in the definition of the work uh, and the medium of architecture in law, 
copyright law has maintained the link between ideas and their ownership, ideas and persons, and the coherence of those persons and work. And in order to illustrate that, I'm using or we're using an image from Michael Graves' presentation to the co US Congress on the occasion of the writing of the Architectural Works Copyright Protection Act in the US in 1990. So one of the many contemporary artifacts were this particularly particular form of authorship that uh, Anna is describing is maintained is in the ubiquitous AIA contract documents, which may be familiar to many of you, which have governed the practice of architects relative to builders and owners since the earliest, early 20th century. Of course, those three categories of actors are in fact already suspect. Um, but today in the US, many of us continue to practice within this largely unchanged legal and professional framework. Um, one of the legal terms that I think is particularly interesting is the architect's instruments of service, uh, which are defined as representations in any medium of expression, now known or later developed, of the tangible and intangible creative work performed by the architect and the architect's consultants under their respective professional service agreements. So in that uh, kind of dry legal language, um, I think we see two things. One is that the instruments of service holds on to the rights of cultural production, what is described as the tangible and intangible work, describing the content as being part of a realm of ideas. Um, but also the maintenance that uh, architects work is the reproducible product of technical expertise to which builders must always defer, but not also reappropriate for, reappropriate for their own ends. Um, and of course, in the daily life story of doing this work, things are much less clear than they are defined in the contract documents, and they involve negotiation and co-production by actors across many scales. Uh, nonetheless, Architects, architecture's hero stories are embedded even in the driest of contract documents. So to leave you with a question as we start to pivot to the pre presentations of our contributors, cultural theorists Fred Moten and Stefano Harney challenge us to identify and ultimately resist various calls to order around in, uh, whether they are legal terms or profit imperatives or a hero story of some other kind. For us, calls to orders around singular authorship can be found in pedagogy, in licensure, in algorithms, in zoning language, Google Docs, map projections. Following a, answering a call to order, which is here specifically, here in our description, specifically a call to making agency in the discipline of architecture more legible as authorship, makes that agency much more easily extractable and governable, facilitating the consolidation of capital through real estate. So to that end, we might ask what might happen, as Moten and Harney ask, if one does not answer a call to order, or better yet, if we refuse to issue such a call, what kinds of making of architecture might be happening before, during, and after, as well as outside of the various calls to order of the architect author. On that note, uh, we will hand it off to our co-conversationalists, starting with Timothy and Lisa, um, with their text, how to measure, how to measure a shed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you can each have a, each have a mic. Hello. Okay. All right. The case of Mark Maga versus the Welsh ministers concerns a dispute between a man who wished to build a new garden room on his property and the town planning council who believed that the proposed structure would violate its height restrictions. Maga, this man, had applied some years back to his local planning authority in Swansea, Yale, Wales, for a certificate to build the garden shed, which he believed would lawfully adhere to restrictions as outlined within the relevant section of that town's current town and country planning order. When the application was denied, he revised his plans. When the application to build was rejected a second time, Magaw appealed the decision. Mark Magaw versus the Welsh ministers and the city council of Swansea. As in any legal dispute, the stage is set here at the fore with an announcement of plaintiff and defendant along with the reason for their quarrel. 
As the text of this case makes clear, each side has arrived to court with conflicting ideas about how a building's final form ought to be determined. McGaw has designed the shed and used an architectural drawing set to demonstrate the desired structure. We could say he's authoring with an architect's mentality. What building form will maximize that building's future use? The town council, on the other hand, wrote a planning order, using a zoning legislation to reduce the chance that a new construction will inconvenience its neighbors. We could say that the council is authoring with a jurist's mentality. What building form will minimize future conflict between neighbors? At once, however, it becomes apparent that this imagined disciplinary splint is not so clean. The court case itself forces a confrontation between the two authorial claims and reveals that architectural authorship does not and probably cannot reside solely with Magaw's prospective plans. So the plaintiff and defendant of any legal case offer competing accounts of their story in order to sway the judge this way and that until a judgment, a final judgment can be reached. Here, we offer that architecture resides between the proper names on the title page of the court's written judgment, a conjunction that here allies the adversarial implications of any court staging of plaintiff versus defendant. Architecture, of course, will be affected by the judgment, but equally, architecture will play a role in determining that judgment in the first place. So any impulse to assign architectural authorship solely to McGaw and his drawing set must therefore be tempered. While plaintiff and defendant have arrived each with a coherent and a distinct approach to projecting the building's future form, in the courtroom, they will inevitably become, become co-authors of it. The issue arising under the GPD order in the present case concerns how to measure the height of the proposed building. We refer to Article 1, Stroke 3 of the order as follows, quote, unless the context requires otherwise, any reference in this order to the height of a building shall be construed as a reference to its height when measured from ground level. And for the purposes of this paragraph, ground level means the level of the surface of the ground immediately adjacent to the building in question. So the immediate conflict here concerns a determination as to whether or not Magaz Shed exceeds 2.5 meters in height above the surface of the ground immediately adjacent to it, the cited limitation imposed on his structure by the applicable planning order, or how to measure a shed. A, simply ma a simple matter, surely, from the disciplinary perspective of the architect, but a less simple matter in view of the law, which requires a stipulation of its own terms. While an architect might make the easy claim that a proposed building will not exceed 2.5 meters and will handily produce elevation drawings to prove it, for law, measuring cannot be a mere calculation set against the blank margins of the drafting page. It must also be a method of reasoning. Quite literally, law requires us to ask, from where do we measure, to where, and crucially, for what purpose? The land was excavated on both sides of the boundary so that the wall could be put up, and on the neighbor side it was backfilled whereas the claimant did not backfill and indeed extended his excavation because intention was to build this new garden room. This meant that the rise of the slope in the back garden was sharper. A large level area was created at the top of the rise, which is about 1.5 meters higher than the level of the patio, where the shed would be, whereas against the southern boundary wall, the ground level seems to have been much the same as that of the patio. I do not take what is represented on the plan and the elevation as necessarily being a precise and accurate record in every detail of what was and presumably still is on the ground, but it is an indication providing context for what the claimant said in his statement in the proceedings, which makes it possible to understand the effect of the points at issue. Now these drawings were not the first attempt to provide requisite evidence of the original ground. For the trial court phase, inspectors that had been sent by the planning council submitted reports of their first-hand observations of the site in question. These offered what the inspectors understood as equally valid evidence, a child's trampoline, some plantings, evidence that the excavated ground was indeed an actively used part of the domestic curtilage. However, since it is specifically a height metric that this planning order curtails, this observed evidence will not suffice in the courtroom. Measured drawings will be given preference. Before I discuss the arguments about what is meant by ground immediately adjacent to the building, I must briefly describe the claimant's fallback position represented by his latest designs. The critical difference is that the walls of the building are set back from the boundary wall by 150 millimeters. The plans and the elevations show that this gap between the building and boundary would be backfilled to the same level as on the flank of the building. 
These drawings, as you can see, are not reproduced in the text of the decision handed down by the court. They are replaced by the court's textual translation. For the judges, the drawing set, while helpful, does not and probably cannot constitute a so-called precise and accurate record. This equivocation points towards an uncertainty in judging the limits of the drawing itself and being able to know the distance between the drawing and the ground that that drawing represents. In my judgment, it does not assist at all to contend that all it, that is needed is a point, possibly an imaginary one, from which a measurement is to be taken, even if it has no other utility or significance. One must be able to identify something which can fairly be described as ground which has a surface level. The bottom of a notional or wafer-thin gap between two walls built flush to one another cannot be regarded as a ground with a surface or indeed be regarded as a ground at all. As it seems to me the most relevant ground on the southern side of the proposed building regarding assessing the impact of the building on local visual amenity is the neighbor's land just on the other side of the boundary wall. If the proposed building would be built so as to abut the boundary wall, what is the ground that will be immediately adjacent to the relevant part of the new building? Immediately next to the building is the boundary wall. Beyond that is ground forming part of the neighbor's garden. That wall is not ground. The neighbor's garden is the ground nearest to the relevant part of the building. It seems to me that it is a proper construction of the words to hold that the ground, which is just the other side of the boundary wall, is ground immediately adjacent to the building. In practice, it is this ground that provides the context in terms of assessing the extent to which this new building would affect visual amenity in the neighboring area. The judges are calling McGaw's buff, bluff, by calling out that adding the gap in an attempt to make the legal problem easier to resolve, to produce that point of measurement, will only produce an architectural problem. McGaw's plans were not amended to satisfy the purpose of the legislation, which was, among other things, to produce good neighbors by preserving sight lines but rather it was added to satisfy the proof requirements of this legislation by providing that uh, point of ground. The wafer thin gap is thus rejected by the judge as useless. He does not accept that this space can provide the notional point of measurement. The judge calls out the newly proposed 150 millimeter gap for what it probably was all along to McGaw, absurd. Does the judge recognize here the limits of legal authority by deliberately allowing the practical parameters of the building to take priority over the legal ones? On the one hand, the surface of the neighbor's land is not immediately adjacent to the proposed garden room. On the other hand, what is immediately adjacent to the proposed garden room is not the surface of the ground. Although it is necessary to find something immediately adjacent that can fairly be called surface of the ground, it is also necessary to find surface that can fairly be called immediately adjacent. I do not think it is possible to resolve the tension between these two by purely linguistic means. In sum, there's no measurable ground immediately adjacent to the proposed building in question, and so in order to adhere to the parameters of the planning order, a translation will be necessary between drawing and text, between architectural thinking and legal thinking. So it's surprising at first that such a trivial concern, how to measure a shed, could make its way through a succession of tribunals, inspections, planning reviews, court proceedings, all the way to an appellate judgment. But in this case, Mark McGaw versus the Welsh ministers contains within its trivial concerns a difficult negotiation between representation and reality. The interweaving of language as parsed by the judges brought legal thinking and architectural thinking together in a manner that illuminates a disciplinary exchange between the two, an exchange that both proceeds and extends beyond the matters at hand. We can imagine that architectural thinking will attend not merely to the letter of the law and, and its spirit, of course, but also the means, textual, visual, oral, and mechanical, by which law attempts to establish evidence as its evidence. Likewise, the next draft of the applicable zoning legislation might very well attempt a clearer form of the words in order to anticipate the calibration of quantitative precision and qualitative variation. We know for sure that there will inevitably be another dispute invol involving other words that maybe aren't so clear and other buildings and sites that aren't quite so acquiescent. There will be another di dispute difficult to resolve by linguistic means and another one and probably another. Until then, we adjourn. <laughs> <laughs> you can do wherever you want.
Amanda? Yolanda? Oh, we're just gonna take this off. I may need a towel to wipe my hands. A what? A towel to wipe my hands. A thumb um, towel. But right now, for the phone. Like Okay. Um, hello, everyone. So um, I'm actually going to read from the interview um, on the Black Reconstruction Collective. Uh, the interview was with myself and Amanda Williams. Um, I'm the outgoing president of the Black Reconstructive Collective, and Amanda is the incoming president. Um, so I'll be reading the voices of either um, Anne or Anna and Amanda and myself. Um, <laughs> so, uh, um, Anne Louis, you both author themes that seem to connect directly to the BRC, the Black Reconstruction Collective. Could you tie some of these ideas about refusal as well as about generosity, cred credit, and power to the decision to form the BRC? How do you see it now? Y.D. me. Uh, these topics do relate to the formation of the BRC, as well as to the acts that we have performed since. The initial formation had to do with a confluence of things, one of which was being part of this group with an amazing advisory board and reading and reflecting on refusal. The other had to do with the Museum of Modern Art's exhibition structure, structure being given an opportunity to do something, but not enough money to do it with, um, with many of the participants not having a firm or a university to, subs to subsidize their production. Those were the two big issues that helped galvanize, galvanize the move toward the collective. Um, I should just say that uh, the collective formed as a result of an exhibi exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art um, in 2001, the spring of 2001, called Reconstructions, Architecture, and Blackness in America. Uh, Amanda Williams, A.W. The further away we get from the origins of the BRC, the more it becomes clear that Sean Anderson, the curator, and Mabel Wilson, co-curator, were themselves trying to shift the format of exhibition making, in particular, architectural exhibition making in that institution. Their effort to shift the format to include an advisory board and to imagine that exhibitors might benefit from interacting with each other before the opening night provided the conditions for a perfect storm. We take these kinds of interactions and collaborations for granted because this is how architectural ideation happens, but it all seemed radical in the MoMA world. Combined with that, uh, the idea about refusal, and then bring to the table leading scholars of this kind of manifestation. Mix those two things together and toss it all in um, with the other things that were happening in the world, um, like George Floyd, um, the death of George Floyd, including the unwritten understandings about blackness among black practitioners and black creative makers. It was a perfect storm for creating a situation where we, because of our individual credentials and backgrounds, understood that we had to do this. We, we have to do this, and it isn't anything, and it isn't annoying that we have to do this, but we are so glad that we have to do this and that we know how to do it. It was a moment. Voltron, we've got to get it together. Let's go. It was one of those bittersweet co-authorships that had to happen. It wasn't a choice in a certain way, but we also knew how to navigate that. Maybe we did not know how to navigate the particulars, but we knew that we could figure it out. I don't know if we would have been able to author in that way a decade ago or a generation ago, um, a generation of ourselves ago. YD. Me. I think we would have. I remember this amazing meeting with the advisory council in which we, were, we all presented work. 
uh, which set the precedent for presenting to each other and enabled us to see ourselves in each other. We're not the same, our work is different, but there were confluences and some repetition of interests and then just great differences. It was amazing for us to present and see each other and to be part of this, but it was also amazing for the advisory council. I think to be a part of this conversation and to see production in a different way than they are used to. The group congealed at this point, even without us knowing. It was similar when we started giving lectures together as the BRC. We would each take on a theme, work on it independently, and then present it to each other. But there was tension also. For instance, MoMA gave us individual contracts and we were all spoken to individually, which introduced this weird tension between the individual and the group. It was akin to a divide and conquer approach, uh, which came to a head at one point. We compared contracts. They were all the same, but this enabled us to consider them as a group. Um, our group, our second group act, after forming the collective, was to collectively modify the contract. Anna Milyaki. Apart from the amazing social and intellectual work that transpired in the workshops you are describing, the most radical gesture of the group, the creation of the group itself, was closely followed by the making of the 10 by 10 fabric printed manifesting statement hung at MoMA over Philip Johnson's name. Could you describe the writing of the BRC's manifesting statement? YD, well, it was co-authored. <laughs> AW, yeah, I'm laughing because it was like everything you do with 10 heads, rich for it, but also that much more all over the map. Everybody dove in on a single Google Doc. It was like, add an S, take away an S, push these. People were going back and reversing somebody else's writing, you would think, I thought I moved that. And then you moved it again and smoothed it out. There came a moment when we decided to go, we decided so-and-so is going to have the last edit and then we're all going to go with it. YD, we still have the document with all the edits. AW, it really was beautiful. We each have a particular voice that comes from different writing styles. The paths we've chosen, the different ways we um, have chosen to show up in our allied fields. It starts with a mix of artsy writing, journalistic, third person, and first person, and historical. Then at some point, we had to make a decision about the best way to address the audiences that we wanted to speak to. The result was rich, like chocolate on chocolate on chocolate. There are so many layers to it. I find we are constantly saying, let's go back to the mission. Well, how do you dismantle white supremacy? What is the unfinished project of reconstruction? There are some very powerful things in the manifesto that are just kernels that we keep returning to. It forces us to be present. It's not like your swim team's mission hung on the wall, reminding you to try really hard. It requires a kind of active work which is powerful. It's tiring sometimes, at least for me, but it's powerful because you have to keep committing to it. We have to keep committing to it, the individual and the collective. The words stay the same, but it keeps changing in terms of how it directs us. Uh, AM, it's an amazing document. You are describing the manifesting document as a future accountability of sorts, accountability to each other and to the world. I felt called upon it too and was reminded by the W.E.B. Du Bois notion that the voice is a vocation. Y.D. There is a certain openness to the document. In our future acts, we will get to explore and define as a group how to dismantle white supremacy. The manifesto is set up in such a way that our acts moving forward can give it more de definition. AL and Louis. I also think that it prompts you to think about how you might have changed since you last read it. When it first was published, I had a certain kind of personal relationship with it. And then I reread it before talking to you and I realized that I've changed in the interim. And now this text has a different meaning for me. 
A.W. I think that when we look at all this in a decade or 20 years from now, the simultaneous impact of the pandemic and of racial reckoning will be obvious. Uh, Lake Olalakan uh, Jephthis, one of our members, calls it the Pandolution Revolemic. The fact that perhaps democracy or America, as we understood it, was coming to an end of people having to confront that they were in this document, even if they were not black. Whoa, okay, it's an unfinished project. We were meeting with the heads of MoMA on the day the Capitol was being stormed. The intensity of that document, I think, is also born of this kind of 11th member, which is America, or society itself. For me, the further we get away from the manifesto, the clearer it is that we were there to meet the challenge. We were there at that moment, and we were ready to do what needed to be done. Okay. That's good. Um, I am <laughs> just going to read the manifesting yes, statement. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, Which thank you. it was referring to. Okay. A nation constituted in conflict with its own ideals would need to be reconstructed before it could be fully constructed. It would need to go to war with itself and win, then reconstruct itself differently. This is not rebuilding, but reconstructing to the core of governance, citizenship, history, infrastructure, and the distribution of land. Paradoxically, the people who did the constructing and must now do the reconstructing are likely to be the same. Laborers in one instance and authors in another, designers of this nation and of themselves. The Black Reconstruction Collective commits to continuing this work of reconstruction in black America and these United States. We take up the question of what architecture can be not as a tool for imperialism and subjugation, not a means for aggrandizing the self, but a vehicle for liberation and joy. The discipline of architecture has consistently and deliberately avoided participation in this endeavor, operating in complicit, complicity, com, sorry, complicity with repressive aspects of the current system. That ends now. We commit ourselves to annihilating the willful blinders that have enabled architecture as a profession to continue to profess its Eurocentrism as a virtue and claim apolitical ends. We reject the boundaries established by nascent states, challenge the spatial manifestations of anti-black racism, and encourage creative agency and liberatory practices. This collective portal unites artists, scholars, architects, artists, and organizers across time and space. With this commitment to black freedom and futurity, we dedicate ourselves to doing the work of designing another world that is possible here where we are with and for us, the Black Reconstruction Collective. Good evening. Um, thank you for the warm invite, Anna and Anne. Uh, very excited to be part of this uh, log issue. Hello, everyone. Um, super excited to be here tonight. So uh, I wanted to go. Uh, I wanted to start by going back to the to the call to the to to this curatorial uh, proposal because I think that the question that uh, Anna and Anne uh, raised with this log issue is um, absolutely fundamental and necessary in 
architecture today. And the question is, um, in, what, in what ways, uh, and Anna and Anne were speaking about it uh, uh, at the beginning of this session, but the, the way I translate it is, in what ways can architecture expand agency in architecture today? And so what is agency and uh, why is it uh, so important? Agency is the capacity to act, the capacity to act. So agency in architecture is the capacity to act, to produce an effect, to generate a transformation. So it is the capacity to address those very important issues that need to be addressed in the moment, whatever that moment may be. No? It's the capacity to deal with difficult events, uh, new events, cultural, social, economic, environmental events. Agency is our capacity to deal with events that we've never dealt with before. Okay, so agency is the very nature and condition of all of life. Every living thing invents a response that enables it to at least partially survive for some length of time. And that's what I understand as agency. Agency is not freely expressing who I am. Agency is the capacity to act. So we keep coming back to this, no? Agency is the capacity to act. Um, and I wanted to uh, come to, to this idea that the capacity to produce a, a, an effect translates directly uh, to the type of relationship that exists between a subject and an object. So how does one begin to problematize architecture's agency by exploring uh, the various relations between subject and object engendered by the discipline, by revealing the complexities of this relationship through an effort of complicating agency? Now, I'm not diminishing the concept of agency. It might sound like I am. I'm not. I'm complicating what we understand as agency. So others have tried before to complicate what we understand as agency in, in many different disciplines, and I'm going to show uh, three particular examples. Uh, one instance of someone trying to complicate agency appears when, when cognitive scientist Heinz von Foster wrote an essay uh, with the title On Constructing a Reality. And uh, in this essay, he claims the environment as we perceive it is our invention. Uh, perception, uh, which uh, uh, is this a spa is a space or is this gap uh, between the perceiver and the perceived, was until then uh, only an act of cognition. It was a, a, an effort to uh, bridge, uh, bridge a gap uh, with an act of uh, world making, totally different from agency, right? Agency which, in order to bridge uh, this space between subject and object, uses creation, no? an act of world making. So a agent and uh, or agency and uh, perception, two different things, until uh, Von Foster comes and says, uh, no, uh, I can prove <laughs> that uh, you can perceive uh, things that are not there and you do not perceive things are, that are uh, uh, there. So perception makes up reality. Perception is as much an act of world making as it is an act of world knowing. Uh, here in a way he's saying perception is an agentic power. Um, and so, uh, yeah. The second, so this is, uh, this was uh, Foster uh, trying to complicate uh, agency. The second example is uh, environmental historian Jason Moore who redefines the term oikios. This is a term that comes from philosophy and botany in the classical Greece is the relationship between a plant, a species, and the environment. So Kios, in Moore's view, uh, in Moore's view is, uh, quote, the creative, generative, and multilayer relationship of a species and environment by which all life makes environment or all environments make life. Uh, so this is a new way of conceiving agency. The Kios, uh, Moore says, is a multilayer uh, dialectic comprising flora and fauna but also our planet's manifold ge geological and biospheric configurations, cycles, and movements. So um, Jason here super complicates uh, agency. What he's saying is one agency is not singular, it's a manifold of agents, agents 
and two, it is multidirectional. The, ob the object makes the uh, subject as well as the subject makes the object. And the third example is the term Umwelt, uh, as defined by biologist uh, Jacob, Jacob von uh, Wexpool. This term made it to the essay uh, of the long issue that I, that I uh, wrote. According to Wexpool, just to give a, a brief uh, explanation, every organism inhabits its own distinct perceptual universe, or Umwelt, which integrates a perceptual world and an action world. Again, here, like in the case of uh, Haynes von Foster, perception appears as a critical factor in the act of world making. Wexpool defines, for instance, the sea urchin umwelt, the oak tree umwelt, and the human umwelt, among many others. But what is interesting here is how each of these unique environments, environment slash agencies, comes with its own way of experiencing time. He says, it is, uh, there is not one time only, uh, there is many times, uh, or there is as many times as there are, as this, there are subjects. Uh, time varies according to the number of moments experienced by different subjects within the same span of time. Okay, so time. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, always a very wonderful uh, way of entering architecture. Uh, and to me, what was absolutely inspiring of the concept of Umwelt uh, was precisely this idea of the entanglement uh, of the subject, the object, and time. And so the question become, became uh, how expanding architecture's perception of time shakes the, no the notion of agency in architecture. Now I'm quoting here myself uh, as a way to enter my own uh, set of uh, agents uh, in the talk. Uh, and now I'm going to briefly um, um, talk about the, the piece, uh, uh, the deep uh, and shallow timescales of the built sphere, which was an attempt of exploring precisely this, uh, this question. So I'm not going to go into, into the whole argument, uh, but just, uh, I just wanted to share uh, perhaps what is the most interesting moment to me, which is the moment when the piece explores uh, what happens when we ask uh, this question of uh, agency and time through the lens of deep time, no? the multi-million year time frame within which the Earth has existed. What happens when we consider the time of the Earth? Uh, what happens when the Earth becomes the subject? And so the notion of the built sphere emerges in the piece as a uh, provocation. Uh, uh, the term is, uh, or the built sphere is a term that I make up to talk about architecture as a planetary agent, architecture as a new geological paradigm interconnected with the other spheres of the Earth systems. The built sphere is the proliferation of the built across the planet. The built sphere is uh, architecture as driven not only by human actions, but also by other material events, where humans and extra-human agencies are co-creators in the architectural creative process. And so perhaps uh, this quote is the moment of the essay uh, that, that describes better how the built sphere has the potential to complicate agency in architecture. And I'm quoting uh, here directly from the essay. Uh, indeed, we can apply to the built sphere the exact same argument that geologist Peter Huff uses for the technosphere. Certainly, the built sphere could not exist without its human component. On the other hand, neither can any other system maintain its existence without the participation of its component. The hydrological cycle could not exist without the supporting activity of, of its water molecules, the rock cycle without its mineral components, and so on. That the built sphere requires for its function the, uh, the participation of certain critical parts even if they are people, that does not by itself distinguish it from other geological paradigms. So human agency here, like that of molecules of water. Uh, and then somewhere in the essay says, uh, to embrace the built sphere independence from simply human agency is to adapt a new perspective in which architecture's agency becomes a complex formation that involves humans and more than humans including, for example, the geological substrate that allow it, allows it to be. That is a new conception of agency that situates, situates architecture in a world of entanglements between geological, technological, human, animal, and viral bodies co-producing the environment. And this is why agency, it seems to me, is kind of a ridiculous idea. <laughs> We're like little ants in the world. We have agency, but it doesn't matter to anyone but ourselves. 
Now, this is really hard to get through. We are agents, but so are ants, bees, and wasps. We're all agents. Everything alive is an agent. And perhaps every living organ within every living being is also an agent. So the problem for me is not agency. The problem is too much agency. There's too much agency. In every living thing, there are agential forces struggling this way and that. So the problem is always the cohesion of an entity and not its disparate um, uh, agential forces. Now come to the table, please. <laughs> yes. Let's take this. I mean, maybe need, we need to mix up a little. I mean, all Well, I guess, no, 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 no. I mean, we need the microphones actually to be with you, so maybe this is fine. It's okay. okay. How is everyone? Are you ready for the next chapter? Are you ready for the next chapter? Yes. Yeah, I mean, the key questions to us have seemed, or the things that uh, we know connect the essays and con connect these essays to other essays in, in log, uh, and all of it to the question of co-authoring, uh, have to do with temporality, uh, as well as translation. And, and these, in different ways, uh, cross the things that you have talked about. So we were wondering if anyone wants to take this on, and we can be more precise in pointing, you know, in, in asking you to answer things. But uh, first, a more general thing, if you can talk about the way in which the, a kind of an expanded conception of what authorship might mean or co-authorship might mean connects to the question of time and time being understood differently, uh, as opposed to a kind of a hero story in which we generally find the find ourselves at the photo, photo op moment uh, in architecture. What does it mean to expand time in which we consider authorship? And then uh, the question of translation is the one that uh, maybe once we expand again, who has agency? Um, this brings us quickly to the question of what language are the co-authors speaking? Can they understand one another? Is this uh, a question of words or translation or some other sort of uh, question of judgment across different uh, disciplines, media, etc. And for me, one of the things as a historian that I keep asking myself and, and for us as people trying to nudge the, <laughs> nudge the, the needle on authorship towards co-authorship, one of the questions that comes out of these is the question of how we narrate this kind of complexity such that it can have uh, a presence in the discipline. Who would like to begin? <laughs> I'll start. Um, because your questions actually relate very much to the um, beginning of the interview. Um, so in the interview, um, Amanda and myself are asked questions about, are asked questions about our um, individual <laughs> practices as well as uh, the group practices as the BRC. And so, um, you know, I'm a, a partner in an office, Studio Sumo, uh, kind of working in um, collaboration with another individual for many years, and then uh, working individually on independent projects, research projects, and then part of this group with 10 other members as the BRC. Um, and, and so um, thinking about time, though, I think is really interesting because just 
um, it makes me think about the arc of my practice and the practice, you know, the architecture practice and research practice and how um, some things take a lot of time to cook and um, like when you kind of look at the arc of a practice and how, um, how things develop, um, you actually need time to see that happen. You need time to, especially with the work that I do where you know, part of the practice is working with clients um, and part of the practice is, is looking at race and architecture and always in presenting the work, people ask, well, how do these two things go together? Um, do they have any relationship with each other? And so what's been really interesting for me is like over time in the practice is you're able to see influences from one sphere into another. But the question makes me think about all the people that I've worked with, you know, that we've worked with over time that made this happen because um, I do not do all the drawings myself. I I am very dependent on other people to kind of help me develop the work that I do. And so they are also part of this um, larger, um, you know, co-authoring project of the practice. And um, one of the things we talked about in the ar article is how in architecture there's this kind of hierarchy of, um, well, there's, there's usually, you know, in a practice there's a hierarchy of relationships um, traditionally where the architect is at the top and the people who kind of help are like, you know, like stepping stones um, below. And so one of the things that Amanda and I were talking about was just trying to like um, uh, address that in our own practices. Um, Amanda as an artist, myself as an architect and you know what we could do to, to sort of rethink that. Um, and then the other question that you asked, what was it? Translation, or sort of translation. Once we, okay. Yeah. So there was a note in the um, also in the uh, interview which had to do with um, working with groups of people and especially working with my partner. There's this way that um, I call it like grounding, like where we share ideas and experiences, and it kind of sets the field so that people are thinking in a similar way and you can create together. So it's this, it's this practice of just um, everyone kind of getting on the same page, which actually is really important in collaborative practices. And so that's in the um, interview and I just wanted to bring that up. Okay, so I'll go. Um, so I, I mean, I think that the question of time and translation are very re re related and that uh, perhaps well, I always come back to time uh, as a way of uh, offer a response a and I think, for you. yes, it's very soft. <laughs> well, not soft really, actually it's not that soft. <laughs> Maybe that's why um, uh, it's not that soft. But so I think for me, the, the question of uh, um, translation and, and time relates to uh, the, or I, the way I would enter this question is through the notion that we don't realize that mm, there are multiple time orientations, time perceptions, time uh, in, in the different ways of articulating time and that uh, we in many ways that as uh, West School uh, is saying uh, each of these times relate to a particular subject no? and I think that um, somehow entering into this understanding is um, starting to leave the, the depths of the, of the very problem of uh, understanding each other. I think that there, there is one uh, um, particular moment when this is, this is very clear and is when we are trying to uh, include uh, others in our particular ways of experiencing the now, as if the now is, is universal and uh, um, unilateral. Um, so the, the other day I was, so and I, I always, and again, going back to this idea of softball for me, not really soft, but I'm teaching this course, the Deep Time uh, uh, Project, precisely because I think that uh, uh, something that is necessary uh, today and uh, required <laughs> for us is uh, to acquire a higher degree of uh, time literacy if we are to become 
um, uh, well, m more open to diverse uh, subjectivities, more sensitive to the environment, and that's why I normally think or normally speak about the earth as a subject, no, as a way of uh, also including that that uh, sensitivity to the environment. And um, th uh, this week we had this uh, lecture now talking about the different these different temporalities and translations. We had a lecture by. Uh, Richard Fisher, who is um, uh, a journalist in the BBC, he has uh, he's editing a, a um, series called Deep Civilization, and is very interested in. He is very interested in from other uh, perspective, obviously not from the architectural perspective, but but uh, the idea of expanding uh, uh, um, perceptions of time in society, and he has written a, a book that is not out yet, but he uh, gave the, my students a chapter, it's called The Long uh, View. And the, the second part is, and I, I wrote it somewhere, um, beca because it's long, but it's, what I want to say it properly, is why we need to transform how the world sees time, just to, so, so that you realize how important it is for him, uh, this idea, and he came to explain, uh, all these different constellations of temporalities that exist today that we don't acknowledge, uh, acknowledge for example, uh, ideas like uh, indigenous people in South America, the Aymaras, think time completely different than, uh, than we think uh, time. No? We normally uh, perceive time or the future in front of us. No? This is where we are going. For the Aymaras, the future, uh, the word that they use for the future is uh, in the back, right, and the press and the and the past is in front, no, because they don't see the future and therefore it's in the past. And somehow this, which seems something very subtle, all of a sudden uh, uh, has uh, incredible uh, uh, consequences, no, for mm -hmm. for the ways we understand each other and translate each other. Are able to yeah. s to begin to translate? Do you want to say something about shallow and deep? Shallow and it's deep. In the yes, it's in yes, the text, it is, but it, was, yes, it didn't yes, come out today. Yes, the kind yes of it is in the text. Uh, it's in the text, and that's why I was saying that uh, today I didn't. Um, I was not talking about the argument of the piece per se, but what I wanted to do is to contextualize the piece within a larger interest of mine, which is time and agency. But with with time and agency, this piece collapses. Uh, one particular argument, which is the idea that uh, there are uh, these two, it's essentially uh, uh, what I'm saying, the idea that we need to acknowledge other temporalities, but uh, in this particular piece, I concentrate in the uh, deep time of the earth, right? The, the, the idea that uh, uh, deep time is going to bring um, uh, ways of, per of perceiving um, architecture uh, that that uh, offer a whole new set of sensibilities that we normally don't tend to attempt. But n obviously when we talk about deep time, and this is a, a critique uh, that people that are interested in deep time uh, uh, tend to receive, is that, okay, deep time is, uh, uh, doesn't really acknowledge the, the, uh, um, the crisis and the, pro and the very urgent problems that, that we are living right now. So the piece is trying to situate um, deep time as a frame that includes those uh, type of temporalities uh, as well. No, I'm thinking that the shallow time uh, ex uh, uh, exists within that deep time and that uh, within the human uh, temporalities, for example, there are also many different types of formations. Wex School was very uh, instrumental to, to begin to think these ideas. Um, because he obviously uh, think about shallow time, no? the sea urchin uh, uh, umwelt, but in different uh, species or organisms. What I was trying to think is, could we think that within the human species, there is different umwelts, right? Different also constellations of temporalities, no? that uh, it's not the, the time of the human, but uh, so anyway, okay. that, that was there. The judge or the cri <laughs> critic? Who's the commentator? I can say two quick things. Um, <laughs> oh, uh, just about the time. Uh, judges always seem obsessed with setting precedent <laughs> in one way or the other, and so by necessity are in conversation with the future. 
but they're not going to be famous for it unless you're on the Supreme Court, really. <laughs> so maybe that makes it a little different from architects being obsessed with their legacy in a way that could be interesting to talk about. But um, I was thinking about the translation, of, you know, when you were talking about agency, and this is not the kind of agency you mean, Christine, but maybe this is, could be useful as part of the conversation, but the drawing set, for example, that's taken up by an architect as a way to author, and in the case that we looked at by the judge as a form of evidence, it's the same thing, mm -hmm. but for each, it has a, its own specific role in the narrative of architectural production and art, or the narrative of legal production, and I think, f for maybe for, for, for us, the question could be how these narratives can start to be talked about together. Um, I don't know if that, I, I didn't mean to put the words in Timothy's mouth, but at least that's uh, something that's I'm interested in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. The so. literal, the literal um, anyway, a different kind of agency, I know, but. Oh, we're interested in all of these, right? Our, our bag <laughs> contains them. Um, okay. I'll just add for the question of time, I think what I, what I hope comes through in the piece is how hard it is to overstate how trivial this case is, <laughs> how just shockingly disproportionate is the amount of time spent on this case in relationship to the object that is being produced and the, the kind of goals and aims of everybody concerned. And I think what that could be described as if we frame it around time is a very vivid actually dilation of the time of a kind of architectural thinking against the time of legal thinking, which takes a, a much you know, more distant view. As uh, Lisa is saying, thinking both about precedent, this case is dealing with ramifications that were posed you know, a century earlier about property, and then it's planning for its own future. But the fact is, the guy was able to draw his garden shed, you know, file it, and then four years later, you know, he's finally able to build it. Um, and so this kind of um, extensiveness, I think we could think of as, an, and maybe it's similar, a dilation of time, mm -hmm. right, that, that happens through these two very different um, kind of strategies of thinking or modalities of thinking. Yeah, at, I mean, at the risk of saying something obvious about the issue, one thing that stands out to me in all these comments about time is I think when Anna and I were thinking about all these texts together, on one hand, co-authorship is a political choice and a, and a conscious act, and I think we see that, uh, Yolande, in your conversations about the Google Doc uh, of BRC and the ways that you work together. But I also think all three of these examples, um, in terms of Christina, you're talking about deep time and thinking about the ways in the text you talk about the bedrock kind of shaping the ability of Manhattan to grow in a certain way, or the role of the kind of silent judge whose name we don't know in the shaping of the height of a building, um, or even Yolanda and Amanda talking Timothy. about the kind of historical collectives. Say it again. Tim, it's a Timothy. Mm, yes, uh, uh, it, it, uh, another Timothy. <laughs> um, that there are always kind of co-authors present, right? And that, that maybe is something that should be self-evident, but is not always. Uh, that in any kind of work of architecture or any kind of built environment, we see these other co-authors and, and, and the angles from which we, we want to um, perceive them come out through the kind of subjectivities, whether they're different temporal subjectivities, they're different voices, or the many kind of chorus of voices that we heard here today. So. I mean, I want to add just a little bit because I do think, you know, we do have texts in the issue that deal with the collectives that will themselves into, into a kind of a collective. Uh, and there is politics to that that we were interested in, but also just seeing uh, co-authorship across the board or authorship now understood as co-authorship is also a political proposition of a different kind on a different register. Um, but maybe how about about how about narrating? This is like my question to this question. And you know, for us in part, the, the log issue in its uh, totality, even though it's not, a, it's not a totality, an absolute totality, but in its collection, begins to address this question of co-authorship as we wanted to address it. Uh, but there could be many more things in it to, and it would continue to sort of uh, do the job. So, but as a historian, I am wondering, again, what do we, or as a, you know, like how do we talk about this in a way that you would find um, appropriate for the kinds of multiplicities that are now involved in it, that include archives and history and judges and laws and 
the Earth and uh, AI bots. I don't know what else and we have in our institutions, past and, and present, <laughs> yeah, so on. Help us. Oh, tell us, tell us. <laughs> oh, no, I know, but it's, it's like really hard because heroes are so useful. So how do you do it without that? So, but Here, so all I, the, na the narrative structure that yeah. we are, have inherited or that we have, you know, yes, it's, it is about action heroes and photo ops. I know, so I don't, I don't have an answer other than Is there a medium? Is there a different medium? <laughs> um, I, Christina I, will go can, for it. Yeah, okay. I, I, I guess that for me the, the question of narration uh, has to do also with um, interpretation or translation, perception, and perhaps I also don't, <laughs> don't have a solution, but I guess that the way I would start thinking the problem is by, um, and I think you already started by uh, bringing the awareness to the structures that we are uh, um, that that are in place that tell the the that tell history. Let's say no. Uh, so somehow, for me, when when you bring up the notion of narration in the way you are bringing it up, bringing it up, I think it speaks about the the story and history. No, those two types of. Uh, ways of basically saying the same thing, right? But one somehow has a weight that uh, mm, feels uh, or is supposed to be the truth, and the other one is supposed to be a fiction. But but those two words have meant very different things across uh, history. For example, the first book um, on uh, history by Herodotus has, I mean, it. It was like kind of a, a series of inventions. I mean, th there was a lot of truth as well, but so much interpretation interpretation from his side that is so interesting, no? that it was the, the way, uh, uh, or that that is the root of history. So somehow for me, all this to say that uh, for me is the idea, uh, or this, this question that you are bringing up uh, mm, uh, uh, really, mm, opens up the, the question of uh, history and story um, and who has the, who has the capacity to, to tell these stories, no? The, again, going back to the subject of who's okay. telling the stories. So, so in that case, is it more that the, the issue is not like how to narrate, but how to not narrate? Because the problem you're pointing to is that narration itself could, uh, could flatten out or appropriate actually forms of co-authoring that are not themselves originally textual or susceptible to being textual so that the what Yolanda was saying, the worker and the designer can be the same person, right? but if you, if the designer is always thought of as proceeding through either text or analogy to text, the drawing, that that's a, the narration then seems like it's the problem, it's the, it's the risk uh -huh. so that it's very easy to assimilate everything into narration but then are you extinguishing all these other kinds of co-authorships that were peeping out in the corners? I mean, our, our case is, uh, you know, already text, it's already narrative. It's like, we're not the people who should be talking. Our case is not the voice that should be talking about narration because you want to start with the problem of sure, but how do you not you, but, narrate But in the stuff. case of this particular banal case that you're looking at, uh, in the case of the, the text here, you are, finding a way to narrate the conflict of two different types of judgment and thereby you allow for law to appear as a co-author on the scene. So, the, I mean, for me, the kind of, wh whether we think of this as annotation, that is a technique that you're using in this particular piece to do something that isn't standard narration. But, but you know, I think the problem is that it only works because we're writing for log and we know, I mean, I think it's <laughs> like, we know it's gonna be architects that are interested. So we already have a hero implicitly that we're trying to shut down. So this is why I'm stumped by your question, you know, because <laughs> uh, like on the one hand that we're calling this shed into being and calling it architecture because now it's in log, but <laughs> is that really, do, is that really getting rid of the hero narrative where, so it's, it's a, a living question for me. Because
guess the issue has multiple voices. You know, like to me, um, each one has a, a kind of approach toward narration, which is actually, I think each one is actually rethinking the idea mm -hmm. of narration. And so, um, so your question is a little baffling because the book has them all, <laughs> yeah, like all these different approaches. And, and it seems like you could just keep compiling more and more, but then one would have to start to analyze them and make sense of them at some point. Um, but it seems like it could be a great compendium, you know, and a resource. I mean, uh, I mean, thank you. Yes, there are different <laughs> things in the in in the issue of log that that might go a long way to start to to answer this thing. The question is, in part, also, what are the the kind of what are the modalities of talking about architecture and agency and architecture that are going to that might help. Uh, produce another culture of talking about it, right? So we are testing some things here with our different co-authors, but that's a question maybe to everyone. Maybe it's a rhetorical, sorry, <laughs> uh, for now. I'm curious if there are any questions in the group or topics that you all wanted to explore more. Um, wait, wait, wait. So, so official. <laughs> um, and I'm glad that I can get lower to my level, which is good. Um, okay, so my question is a little bit maybe somewhere between um, Yolande's sort of uh, today um, live retelling of this interview and the mentioning of the BRC's Google Doc um, mm -hmm. dramas. <laughs> <laughs> and and then Timothy and Lisa, your your presentation today uh, that almost kind of took the form of maybe a little bit of theater. There was some theater I felt today in the way that you delivered um, this case. My question is about personas, and you know, even when you enter a Google Doc, um, you enter a kind of virtual space. Um, let's say for editing or for sharing information, you're immediately given by the interface a virtual persona, right? And I think like the default is like curious hippopotamus or something. And if you're ever on a dock with like a Funny. bunch of people, <laughs> sometimes these, these sort of, um, you know, uh, characters will appear in the kind of menagerie of virtual collaboration or maybe even just virtual sharing of space. Uh, you know, I, I wonder what the role of the persona has to do in sometimes allowing us to enter spaces of collaboration or spaces of co-authorship, and what those personas can maybe lend to us when we're in moments of adversarial or sometimes uncomfortable having to work with, which I think is more in the case of, of Timothy and Lisa, in, in your kind of, in this case that you've sort of opened up to us today, it seems like sometimes even the theatrics and the dressings of um, these systems like the judge and the courthouse and even like assuming those personas and their authority that they hold versus the persona of the kind of, um, uh, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, not tricky, but like smart um, neighborhood, uh, rogue architect, right? Even that is a kind of persona. So I wonder how can, what do personas maybe help us do in, in cases of co-authoring and how do they maybe allow us to even in this kind of very interesting um, case about a not so interesting shed perhaps allow us to go from tragedy and more into comedy sometimes. I want to leave it to you all to answer, but I just want to say I love this question because there's a text in the journal um, by Michael Kubo that talks about a tension between anonymity and the kind of hero story. And that has always seemed to me a binary in architecture, like either we are anonymous or we are this kind of star architect. But the idea of a kind of performative persona has certainly come forward, like whether we willed it to or not, as a tool to make this 
um, journal happen. And yeah, whether that's the like anonymous aardvark in Google Docs um, or something else, that, that has been like another way into being um, with one another that I think is really interesting. I'm not sure. Yeah, hand it to you all. It's totally a perform, I mean, all sport proceedings are performances and everyone inhabits their roles, which is why it's, they're really useful because it's almost, it's almost too easy. Everyone, oh, hold I'm sorry. Oh, I have to hold it? Well, or something closer <laughs> to I'm it. sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it makes it really easy because everyone, you already know everyone's role like already at the beginning. Um, so the characters are built in in a certain way. So you have to read between the lines. I don't know how what more to say about it, but um, I think you're absolutely right. The whole stage set of the case is a performance. And I think for us calls attention to the performance of any submission of evidence or any revised documents or any time you need to confront someone that you don't know how to talk to in any way. When the, yeah, and the evidence, whether in this case it's drawings, everything has to be signed, everything has to be an embodiment of. So it's not just the persona attaching to a person, it's that persona then actually authorizes a whole set of material things in the world. So we're familiar with that with architectural drawings, but then uh, contracts and the idea of the contract and that you guys have talked about too, those are embodiments of persona, right? Or the, the movement of a person out kind of into the world. I mean, I'm, I'm curious, actually, the, I think the implication in your question, too, is that what, what actually are the examples of, of us not being in these situations, being in these, any of these situations as not persona, R right? Where are the examples of, of somehow like a authenticity and direct expression? We have a vague echo of that in the hero architect, but, but even if we look at kind of the raft of, um, you know, memoirs and memoir scandals, you know, over the last 15 years of the faux memoir or the elaborated memoir. It's just, it's sort of more, more evidence or just more examples pile up after pile up after of the non-authenticity, right? Of the, of, of we're never we're kind of reduced down to a person. So I think the implication in co-authoring is yes, like it's always a persona. Like it's hard for me to imagine even a conversation that I've had where I'm not but you know, already outside the, myself. The usefulness of using the, the court case, at, like if, if we're staging architecture and law as the two sides, it lets you see those as personas. Like yeah. it, and if you're architects talking to other architects, you that persona is almost, an, it becomes invisible because you think you're speaking that same language. So I think another useful part of this interdisciplinary smash is that it all of a sudden reveals the performativity, not, uh, not only of the court, but also of the guy resubmitting his drawings and and so on and so forth. No, 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 he's not, he's a cranky guy who like <laughs> absolutely did not need to have done this. Like his persona is like neighborhood crank who could have just submitted a, I think he could have just submitted a, an exception to the rule. Um, so yeah, <laughs> not an architect. Do you have something, Yolande, on the, can you send this, or, can you send this to her? I inhabit or that you know we take on unwittingly because working um, in a partnership or even in a group of 10 um, like there is a tendency to I think use the persona to gauge yourself against the other person so like when we are editing documents you know I sort of know where one person's going to fall versus another um, and sometimes that can be um, actually a like a stabilizing force um, and not necessarily a negative force. Um, but I hadn't thought about that until you asked the question because I think the idea of the persona, to me it seems somewhat, um, I don't know, like negative, but, but I actually think that it is in action, you know, like, you know, I'm not the happy hippopotamus, but <laughs> I'm somebody in the group. Like, like for example, in the group, there the are those of us who um, maybe are kind of focused more on administration, you know, like the longevity of the group or whatever. And, and so that's, that becomes a persona, right? So I think that's very interesting. Yeah, you have to go there, yep. <laughs> Um, 
for me, what was most fascinating and perhaps subversive and reorienting in listening to all of you talk is the various ways in which you define agency under the model of authorship. And authorship is ascribed to so many different things that are non-human, that are an entire system of justice, that are collaborators, that are time. And that leads to such highly contrasting models of relative agency. And so like from the wasp and the ant to quite, I think, egalitarian sort of like collectives in which there's a conversational mode. And I found that to be quite interesting in that all of a sudden sort of we have a model for understanding the particular operations or mechanisms of agencies within something as broad, as indefinable, as a system of justice. And so I would love to hear all of you reflect perhaps on the implications of that to sort of ascribe authorship, that model of which relates to persona, um, to such widely ranging things. And then how that within the process of writing log or writing the essays within this issue of log have perhaps allowed you to redefine what authorship is and what co-authorship means within the contemporary moment in which we are surrounded by other models that perhaps try to do a similar thing, the model of hyper objects, et cetera. And so why, I suppose I would love to understand a little bit more about co-authorship and what that means within this context of the certain issues and kind of deconstructions. Can I ask you a question before the answer? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you think that in a model of co-authorship, authorship stays as such, stable? No. Because I think it's it, it preferences a dynamic of contingency. Because we think, or we were suggesting, there is only co-authorship. Yes. So just to modify the, I don't know how the question now lands exactly, but. Mm. Well, rather I would say then, yes, it's about preferencing the relational or the contingent, right? And so, but however, it is still a dynamic that you are describing and a dynamic that is variously balanced or imbalanced, that is resistance, cooperation, all these different modes. I'm just curious then how you, have you had discussions between you as a team or as a set of co-authors within each essay and between essays for the, for the issue? I think this we, is it. Yeah, I was like, I think I, we're hoping this starts to be one. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not, I, I will just kind of respond to what I think, what I think you're starting to ask. I, for me, in all the contributions, definitely the question of power does um, emerge and whether that's like on the scale of ecology or within a Google Doc, within a collaboration, trying to um, speak truth in an institution to an institution that hasn't always been willing to hear it, um, or even in the kind of, um, like I think, uh, Lisa, you're describing them as like petty negotiations <laughs> around zoning, zoning code and zoning law, like those, those questions of power that um, we think are wrongly shaped by the definition of authorship do continue on in the questions of co-authorship. Um, and it is not that we've left behind those kind of tensions, um, only that they are framed in a different way through this kind of new thinking about all, uh, co-authorship as something that is ever present. I'm not sure if that's, I, if that's how you would think about it as well. I mean, yeah, but I don't know. I didn't, that's not what I, I didn't hear the power question so much as, for me, Jay's question brought up a, a kind of, a, or what I heard was a, a, a kind of an inquiry about what happens when we allow or invite all of these different agents to have capacity to shape architecture. So I'm going to not give, not give all of them authorship rights or whatever, however we're thinking about that, authorship credit, but co-authorship credit in every context. And so yes, 
that means relational description of making and shaping of architecture across any sort of temporal spectrum is primary. And any kind of small uh, uh, faith in specific subjects having the capacity to author architecture is off the table. But I don't know what everyone else thinks, you know, like how you, well, this is the kind of an attempt to talk across different uh, texts, right? So we didn't have a, an advisory board <laughs> to have everyone present to, which would have maybe been a helpful uh, thing for all of us. Um, but so I don't know if you have any comments or questions to one another is now prompted by this. Um, <laughs> I think as a couple of notes, uh, first we were explicitly looking at something that was adversarial in a structure, right? That's what the, how the law works, and so it is power and balance. Um, but it's not unbalanced. But it's not unbalanced, yeah. right? So it's just everybody has their assigned kind of role, but then it is that kind of. Um, a structure not of collaboration or what we loosely call collaboration, it's that adversarial, but to arrive um, at something that's both a negotiation between those two people, but also importantly um, between the single owner and the rest of the world, right? Because the particular case is about nuisance and is it gonna cause a nuisance to other people. Um, but the other thing I, I was thinking, thinking back about writing the piece, we very much were, I think, not so much writing as editing, like deducting, so that we started with this case and it's you know several pages long, the original brief and or the original ruling, and all we did was take things away, basically, and then then yes, we added our thoughts on that, but then I think even then it was mostly about taking away, like yeah. scribbling out all of our various formulations yeah, and then taking that. them away. It's like the judges themselves are authoring, uh, and that was like our unbalanced, yeah. Or, but yeah, I mean the judges themselves are writing this decision that we are engaging with as authors, so it's like a, another level of what are we talking about? Yeah. Um, but what was of interest thanks. to yeah. us from this whole thing is that in a way, we you're witnessing the way in which law, with all of its structures and apparatus, participates in the production of architecture, right? And, and, and so, vice versa. Yes. But may, may I clarify, I, it's not like this, I don't think, I don't see at all laws as vague and large thing. It is tiny and precise, even though it's everywhere. And I think this case is a perfect example of that. Um, it's, it happens at the level of trying to figure out whether or not 150 millimeters is ridiculous or not. And of course there are other cases that have huge imbalance of power and that has to do with the plaintiff and defendant and other structures that we live in. But when you actually look at it, it this is where it's it's little and tiny <laughs> and everywhere. Yes, in a kind of nested way. So this applies to whales, and then some other parts of it apply to another. You know, but that, but that exactly that choreography of space and law, like law is jurisdictional, right? So it only applies to a certain physical space in but the world. I don't even think that's true, because you know, it decides what it wants to take up as being a legal question. I mean, this I, not, this is a totally off topic, but the recent Dobbs decision. I'm sorry. This is, you know. A, uh, like a hundred years there. ago, reproductive rights were not legislated, and now they are. Um, and so that became a purview of, of, of law when it hadn't been in the past. So space is very heavily legislated, I think partly because it is jurisdictional in the way that it is defined currently. But that doesn't mean it encompasses everything. And so this example of the, the, the shed is an example of that particular jurisdiction deciding to take up something that would be that would set something on the ground, and and that's where I see architecture as, as being helpful, um, because or else that particular 
court wouldn't know what to do with this poor crank. So I'm <laughs> You want to just want to just take this mic and ask. <laughs> like, so in that case, if you're considering these things, it sounds almost like this 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 op, this adversarial relationship, this like intimate story that is scripted and performed live for us. Now it seems many of these seem almost like portraits of co-authorship, if that makes sense. And like I'm sort of stuck a little bit on Deborah's idea of persona as a result, which I think like fits well here. So I'm then curious, like, did you see your sort of story of this adversarial sort of like sequence in that, like as somehow a portrait of a certain kind of co-authorship? And what were you, I suppose, like why this, why this episode, this intimate anal episode, <laughs> like of, of a thing, it seems like a very deliberate choice. Uh, deliberate, yes. Accidental, also. I mean, the case existed, and the case, like you know, circulated around. Um, it fit into an existing co-authoring conversation between Lisa and I. That's you know going on for several years. So, um, I think that the the triviality of it is um, was the was the deliberate part. Like I don't know that I would have written yeah. about or that we would have contributed to log written a thing that was about something very broad, a bigger, or something very obviously architectural. Uh, I think the triviality of it was in fact the, the problem that made this a deliberate decision, as far as I remember. I mean, I think the, on this question of portraits, it's a kind of a, a curious way to think about it. I do think that in this issue of log, there may be some portraits and there are some performances of different kinds of uh, co-authorship and also different theories on it. So I think you'll find it's not just a kind of a gallery, but, but it is a collection to stay with the museum here. Can I ask a question that's maybe related to that for you guys? The, um, and it, it's something prompted by uh, Amanda Williams' phrase the, the, that it was a bittersweet co-authoring. That my, my, my kind of take when you entered into this project was the co-authoring is this sort of, it's valedictory and it's great and this is where we want to go and we were doing this because it was exciting. And, and law and architecture may be kind of neutral, but it's still like we want to point it out. But I, reading the issue and thinking about phrases like bittersweet, that it was a bittersweet co-authoring because it was prompted by this kind of negative necessity, right, as well as them being a valuable thing. But then that, and particularly SE's article on Greta Shudlahovsky, that co-authoring is a tragic co-authoring, right? Like it's it's not at all something you would you would prize, right? And and lead towards some non-consent co-authoring. Yeah, so I, I'm curious about that from your perspective as well, because the uh, I think the it's not that the framing pushes forward the the idea of co-authoring as positive and or <laughs> neutral, like architecture and law, it's neither good nor bad. It just is like gravity or something. But the presumption, at least I came into it, and I'm mm -hmm. assuming many readers, is also, of course, co-authoring, because the opposite of co-authoring is authoring, and that's about egoism. And it's striking, even in a moment where we value, see the value of radical individual assertions of singularity, that we also, but we don't want egoism. So how are you, oh, with the issue, both how are you talking and how are you now thinking about the idea of negative, like the, that negative think, valence yeah, of co-authoring? I think this was a very important uh, moment in our conversation, actually, when we decided that one thing we definitely didn't want is the issue to be a kumbaya issue. We wanted to support and to examine some of the really important ways that collectives are formed and all of the problems around forming collectives, all of the obstacles and difficulty doing that. But we also wanted to transform the conception of what it means to make architecture, produce architecture in the world, to materialize it. And that doesn't involve happy collaboration. It involves all kinds of agents operating often uh, in, in opposition to one another, or at least to kind of desires. 
antagonistic collaboration. If you look at, if you, if you begin to think of co-authors everywhere on all different registers, right? Yeah, I think that term bittersweetness is right. I, we, I, was, I was telling Anna before we came here that I just heard from someone else that their initial reaction to our call was to write something called like against collaboration, right? And we do have a text in the uh, journal, um, non-consensual co-authorship, right? So I actually think it was really interesting to us that others had the same reaction we did, right? That in thinking about co-authorship, there shouldn't be this um, like saccharine idea of like holding hands and, 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 and working together in a very neutral way, but instead that um, co-authorship is like just as complex and often negative and problematic, but in different ways, right, than this kind of older formulation of authorship. And so I think in the journal, I'm glad that you also kind of uh, are tracking this thread, like we see talk of conspiracy theorists, right, as a kind of form of ultimate co-authorship, not that we think that conspiracy theorists should be like a model after which we kind of practice ways of making architecture. So um, I think that, yes, the, the negative <laughs> is an important part of this, as well as the real challenges of overcoming that negativity in making collectives that like work well or work well enough in which multiple people can thrive and multiple voices are present. I mean, I think this goes to two things that we already mentioned. One is the kind of question of power. If we think of agents who are equivalent and sort of power disbalance exists in all, on, in all corners of architecture, when you think of authors and agents being human, when you think of co-authors as, as including history or including archives or including critters of one kind or another or whatever bacteria works uh, you know, on, on making the geological layers, then this is a, a much more complicated question. Uh, and the question becomes one of how we think about translating and narrating these relationships because they are not, um, they're not part of a kind of story where we know what the characters need to be. It's not, a, it's not an archetypal story anymore, a hero story, it's something else. Of, of what's the role of the author, right? Or the, uh, of the different co-authors. And, and I think when, when, when we talk about um, agents, actors, actants, uh, we start, uh, like each of these words, authors, each of these words that seem to be speaking about the same thing are speaking about very different things, right? Like an actant, for example, um, suggest more, not so, not so much the subject or the object, I go back to my way of uh, uh, thinking this, but the, the in between, the intervener, no? something that perhaps is more a catalyzer uh, as, opposed that, uh, uh, as opposed to the uh, yeah, Intentionality uh, doesn't yes. have to be exactly. with all of these exactly. Uh, exactly. agents I think that's or actions. The, or yeah, the will, it's, it's really uh, something that needs to be part of the conversation. Do you have any other questions? <laughs> Hi, thank you guys. Um, I have a question in terms of the role that you each feel capitalism plays within this conversation. Um, our studio is tackling cooperatives um, and thinking about the role like the fact that we've been entrenched in these ideas of individuals, individualism and meritocracy as um, foundational tenets towards like success in the US uh, specifically. Um, if you have any commentary on what co-authorship looks like within, within this realm, if it requires a different um, financial system or if you, if it's more of a personal pursuit of like having to unpack how we view um, authorship in its entirety, even just, I heard things about time and the immediacy of when the thought was conceived by yourself versus, you know, the past uh, people who have had a similar thought versus, yeah, actually I'll stop there. Uh, 
I mean, I can, I can, you know, in our, in the three different, in the three different um, structures that we include in our introduction, at least, uh, you know, episodically, we think capitalism has a lot to do with the creation of the hero story or the author story in architecture, whether that is, you know, from the Alberti point, uh, 15th century, or copyright is completely imbricated with capitalism. Who owns the idea? Who benefits from the idea? Who gets the credit uh, for the idea? And how is labor, labor connected or not connected to the credit and authorship? And uh, yeah. So property, property and ownership are there in all of the kind of all over copyright law. And then for us, AIA and the kind of the contracts we write, they are very much about how we value, how is labor valued by the discipline and, and, in, and in the market in this context. So for us, there's no question that what has brought us to this place, the fact that we have a particular kind of uh, narrative of authorship that is, that is powerful in the discipline of architecture is capitalism. It has been there throughout that narrative. Now, how we undo it is a, you know, that's maybe a question we're asking. Um, maybe to add a kind of, uh, well, so yes, our case, the case we talked about is about private property, so it doesn't exist, you know, without the context of capitalism. But another maybe way, and, and I hope this doesn't seem complaining, but um, another way of thinking about it in the context of the issue is, so log pays one honorarium. <laughs> doesn't matter that the two authors, it's one honorarium per piece. It's not a big deal, right? But the fact that there's a structure where, and log itself is part of a nonprofit corporation, so it, its whole existence is, and its ability to actually pay for intellectual labor and the compromises actually it has to make and ask of people in making, uh, in producing that in kind of intellectual uh, work is itself totally embedded within a structure of finance and a structure of remuneration that is, you know, capitalism. And, and the existence of this thing within capital, a capitalist structure of the nonprofit corporation, right, that you have to say, okay, we're gonna make money, but all the money has to go back into the journal and uh, we're gonna sell the issues. Actually, each author did get one issue. So we had to split an honorarium, but we each got one issue, right? <laughs> Um, Does that mean we're not going to get rich and famous? Uh, yeah, exactly. Right? <laughs> you didn't um, have to cut the. So I think it's another way of thinking <laughs> about it, and I understand it's not maybe in the in the kind of necessarily the architectural framework to thinking around property as well. But I think it's an important one too to to roll in, especially in thinking of the of the um, you know description of of MoMA and MoMA you know also not being willing to pay for work and MoMA again is a nonprofit right organization. Um, to think about intellectual work and the intellectual work of architects, architectural theorists, architectural historians within this, within that framework as well. I think also for core three, there's a footnote. <laughs> talk to <laughs> talk to the members of former members of the collective architecture studio, right? Because they'll have some actual uh, tools for you, maybe for thinking. Right, what do you think? Good, we can call it. <laughs> Yolan, you need to do the, the outro. <laughs> We're ending. Um, thanks everyone for coming this evening and thank you to uh, the faculty, staff and students who helped make this lecture series happen. Um, including our lectures and exhibition committee members, Jay He, uh, Huma Gupta, Aidan Flynn, Amanda Moore, Nanasi Shirokawa, and Daisy Zhang. Um, we hope you'll join us next Thursday, September 29th at 6 p.m. for a presentation by Michelle Kaufman, Google's director.